This week we're going to be doing some cherry. We haven't done any cherry in a while. And this is actually an off cut. So there was a cherry burl on the other side. But of course, we've got these wings on each side. So, you know, we'll round this to fit in our casting bucket. And what I'm going to do is use some pearl wine red and some midnight purple. Now people keep saying to me, oh, why don't you start using woods uh, colors that are more complementary to your woods. Well, cherry, of course, is cherry colored and um, or reddish color. So all three of these colors should go together. First things first, let's get this rounded, cleaned up, and then we'll do the next step. Welcome to this week's video. Thanks for stopping in. If you're new here, my name is Jim and I'm the owner of Sprague Wood Turning and I am predominantly a bowl maker and hollow foam maker recent, <laughs> pretty much recent days here. I do do some center work uh, and a little bit of flat work, you know, cutting boards and this kind of business, but this is predominantly a wood turning channel and I am a wood turner through and through. I absolutely love working on a lathe. So the first thing that we needed to do there was round this piece. And if you want to make a rounding jig like you just seen me use, there is a video on my channel that will show you how to make it. It actually works fantastic. The other thing is we're going to cast this piece. So in order to do that, we need to remove all the bark. And for those who are not aware of it, it's not a good practice to use epoxy or resin to bond to bark because over time the bark can delaminate from the wood and then your project's going to fail. Along with that, when you strip the bark off a lot of species, the underlying wood can be very, very slick. So it's best to give that a tooth and that's what I'm doing here with the brass brush. Just kind of giving a bonding surface for the epoxy to stick to and of course to clean up those burl areas. And there you go, ready for casting. This week we're going to be using deep casting epoxy from Designer Epoxy. This is over an inch in depth, so using ArtCast or Pro Series here would probably just end up in thermal cracking. So that's why we need to use a deep casting epoxy this week. That goes for really any epoxies that you're going to use. Uh, they all have certain limitations as far as depth of pour. So it's best to read the manufacturer's uh, instructions to see what it is for yours. There's the midnight purple. Just one spoonful of that is it's actually pretty strong. And uh, the pearl wine red, another favorite of mine as well. So what I want to do is throw some of this hyper shift color in here and this is kind of the normal color and once we put the hyper shift in there it's really cool. So that's the normal color. I've been waiting a little while to use this. Uh, I thought that this would be a good project for this. My only regret, and this is an absolutely beautiful bowl, but I kind of wish I had to put some more of the hyper shift in there. But you, you can see kind of the, it's, it's so hard to explain. It it's, just seems to add another dimension to the epoxy. Very, very cool. There are three different colors. This one is meant for, uh, I guess this was made for blue, purple, and red. So that's why I went with it for this. But there are three different types that go with different colors. Uh, first time using it, but I'm thinking I'm really liking the look of this. So what we're going to do is throw these in the, um, the clean room where there's heat. I'm going to keep an eye on it. It is right now 10 o'clock. So by the end of the day, I want to uh, pour these, hopefully. They'll be ready to pour. And um, really looking forward to this to see what it looks like when it comes out of the pressure pot. So anyway, I'll bring it back when we're ready to do the pour. All right, we are ready to pour 
This is sitting at 55.2, so I know that I've got to pour this because it is going to set. What I'm going to do is pour the two different colors on each side. So hopefully the colors will remain down in here and they're not going to mix. And I might drop a little drop of color in each one of them. Well, I might as well use it all because I know that this is going to actually eat up some of this. There's a lot of cracks in this cherry. And you can see with it moving, that tells me that it's about to set. All right, put this in the pressure pot and we'll see you in three days. All right, we are out of the pressure pot. Uh, there's definitely some different color in here. So, you know, hopefully down inside of the casting, it's going to be the two separate colors. Uh, this did get washed around quite a bit when I was putting it in the pressure pot. I should have just set this in the pressure pot and did the pour in there. Uh, anyway, let's get this out and see what we're looking at. Yep, definitely got some different colors. I was a little worried about thermal cracking because of the heat of the resin, but that seems to be just fine. All right, we've got one center. That's pretty good. The goal, of course, as it is with every piece that I put between centers like this, is to strip off the excess epoxy and then stand back and figure out what we're going to do with this. So while you watch me do this, I've got some really big news and that's coming from sandpaper.ca. I was talking to Boris the other day and I mentioned to him that, you know, we're, we're coming up to 100,000 subscribers and wondering if uh, sandpaper.ca would be able to uh, basically do a little giveaway as well. And he said, yeah, absolutely. So with the 100,000 subscriber giveaway, which will include a project from me, uh, of course, the three gallon giveaway from Designer Epoxy, uh, sandpaper.ca is gonna kick in a $100 credit as well. And of course, that's only for continental USA and Canada. So thanks again, sandpaper.ca, Boris and uh, Georgia, I believe is her name. I really do appreciate it. And so do my subscribers. Uh, so what I'm going to ask people to do, along with uh, Designer Epoxy in the comments, please put sandpaper.ca. And then that way I'll be able to use the comment picker to select a name for the winner of that at the 100,000 subscriber giveaway. I should also mention that you know, you don't have to get the double disc with your order if you happen to win the uh, the giveaway from sandpaper.ca. They have an extensive line of abrasives from sandy belts, sandy sheets, uh, stick-on products, Velcro products, you name it. So that that's a $100 Canadian store credit for uh, any of their abrasives that they sell on their website. Okay, I guess I should talk about what's happening on the lathe here. <laughs> so... Uh, at this point, I'm just trying to get rid of that ghosting that you see on the top. Not a huge fan of that. Uh, if it's on the side for some things, it's not so bad. But at this point, I'm thinking that this is actually going to be the top of this piece uh, so that we can see the burl. So 
in my mind it's important that I get rid of that ghosting because you know I, I just don't think it's going to look right. I should also mention that we're using the Hercules, the 5.8's number 3 from Hunter Tool Systems. And again, that is my go-to tool for working with resin and wood combos that you see here. Uh, I am still a firm believer that if you're going to be a wood turner, you need to master the gouge. But when it comes to these resin projects, uh, resin and burl projects, uh, carbide will beat high-speed steel any day of the week. Uh, I was kind of skeptical when it, when I first started using carbide tools to work resin and now I really see the value of them and you see it each week because I pretty much use it every time I've got a resin piece mounted on the lathe. So you know thanks again to all my other sponsors and you know uh, in the future I will certainly work uh, see if I can get <laughs> some of the other sponsors to kick in some giveaways as well. All right, it's decision time. Let's put a little bit of denatured alcohol on it. Denatured alcohol on here to see what we're looking at. Yeah, yeah, baby, yeah. Loving that resin. Not too thrilled about this. If this, if we leave this as the top. There does seem to be more of the midnight purple up here. And on this side, I think this is the side that we must have mainly poured it on. If we leave this as the top, a lot of this is going to get turned away, but there should be still a decent amount there. That's kind of the way that I had intended on doing this bowl. This was going to be the top. That way you'll see the burl on the rim. But now that we've uh, had a look at this resin, it's a tougher call. <laughs> yeah, definitely got some color separation, so that's awesome. Now if you made this the upper part, you're going to actually probably lose most of this, most of this purple. You know, I could go either way with this. Uh, I, I don't know. What do you think would have been better to leave this as the top part? You get your nice resin banding for the most part over the most of it, but of course you're going to lose your burl. You'll get some further in, but you know it's not going to be a whole lot. Or would you go the other way with it? I am undecided. I'll have to uh, think on it and get back to you. Well, so after some thought, I don't like the look of this, of these cracks and this. Uh, up near the rim, to me, it just doesn't look right. There is purple deeper inside of this blank. So, you know, I'm going to whittle this away. I'm going to leave this the top and this is going to be the bottom. I know that we're going to get some, we're going to lose some burrow figure and I know that I'm going to get some hate for that. But, you know, in my mind, uh, in order to show off the resin beautifully and the burrow, because we're still going to get some burrow on the inside of this, actually probably quite a bit, that this is the direction to go. By all means, you can hammer me in the comments. Because <laughs> I know I'm expecting it. So I forgot that I actually had these. Uh, the other pieces that I used, the other container that I used, was actually samples that uh, Designer Epoxy sent me. This is the actual proper container that it comes in. And so far so good. I'm really loving this stuff and we'll see a lot more of this in the future. So, you know, it's like I say, uh, until you've got basically all the excess epoxy stripped off and you stand back and look at things, uh, you never know what's really going to happen. And, you know, I, 
I hands down went into this thinking, okay, I'm going to leave this this burl rim. But after seeing what the Hypershift had done to both of those pigments, I'm like, man, I don't know, <laughs> I can't I can't lose that that epoxy because we would have lost a considerable amount of it unless I had turned the exact same profile. But the only issue that I would have had with that was the fact that the whole entire bottom of the bowl would have been epoxy. And while that still may have looked cool, I just didn't want to go in that direction with it. And along with that, it would have looked predominantly epoxy with just a little splash of wood in it here and there. Okay, you can stop yelling at me now. I'm just going to go with a shape like this little dip in the center of this that way we're not going to lose our burl and we made that little crack go away that's there too not that that couldn't have been filled with something else but uh we haven't done probably something like this in a very long time maybe not even at all so it's going to be more of a straight line bowl uh next step we got to get a glue block on this because i figure i can probably get a core out of this so waste not want not so in the end, we really don't lose hardly any burl figure and we pretty much retain all of the resin figure. Yes, I'll call it resin figure because it is giving us a really nice figurative resin grain, if you will. I'm just cutting in a tendon right now. I couldn't get the parting tool in there to square off the, <laughs> to square off the tendon. So I'm using, that's the Phoenix. That way I was able to just add a little bit of depth to it and flatten the area where the surface of the jaws will sit against the casting. And of course the reason why I'm doing this is because I want to put a waste block on the bottom of this like I usually do. And I'll explain that again. The reason why I want to add a waste block is there's a couple of reasons. First one, by adding a waste block to the bottom of your work, you can put on multiple coats of finish and not handle the piece. And the other reason is by putting on a waste block, you're also not taking away from the overall size of your bowl. If you were to do an internal mortise or if you were to do uh, incorporate a tenon in the bottom of your work with the work piece that you actually have on the lathe, then you rub uh, size away from the project you're working on so for the new people again that was i just dipped this is a piece of white ash i dipped that into an electric frying pan that's full of hot melt glue and as you can see i don't spare any that's the go no go gauge again and i'm just sizing this tenon so that we can reverse this and get it ready for corn Now that we've got this firmly mounted in the chuck, we're going to have to clean up the surfaces because every time you, you move a piece like this around, you're going to actually uh, knock it out of true. So you have to true it up before you start doing any hollowing or doing any coring. Uh, it's important to do this because the piece will vibrate less and you definitely want that when you're coring or hollowing. We are all set up and ready for coring. This is the Core Pro Cutter from Hunter Tool Systems. This is the one-way coring rig. I've got my number two knife set in. We're going to be able to use tailstock supports since this is a little larger project than the ones we've been working on lately. All right, let's see. 
how this goes. So taking the score was pretty routine. I could have moved the rig, say a half inch to the left and got a little larger core from the piece that we took out. Uh, the one thing you need to keep in mind is, you know, I plan on moving this outboard. And if you're asking why, it's because I'm left-handed and this lathe has left-hand threads on the outboard end. So it's comfortable for left-handed people to work on. So, you know, every time, and I, just, I just talked about this, every time you move this from one chuck to another or reverse it, you're going to throw, throw it off and then you have to chew it up again. So you need to leave yourself enough material there to do that. Now, this ended up being probably a little thicker than I probably should have left it. So that's on me. But, you know, regardless, we got a small core out of this. And uh, that's more than we had before we started. Interesting enough, I've gotten a few messages from people saying, you know, they, they basically want to know where I got my education from. And I'm self-taught. I've never taken a class or a course. I've never had any instruction in person by anyone. Uh, way back in the day, not to date myself, but... You know, I bought some VHS tapes <laughs> and CDs, DVDs, um, instructional videos from other wood turners of the day, Richard Raffin being one of them. And uh, I'm still, I still think that Richard Raffin is is way up there as far as uh, uh, mentors of mine. But you know, I've never. I, it would have been nice to go to a workshop and learn from somebody. But one of the limitations that I had was I wanted to do everything left-handed. And it, and it never even really dawned on me until I was trying to teach my son how to turn a bowl. And I was trying to teach him the way that I do things, but it was the opposite for him. And that's not really a huge thing as long as you recognize that. But um, anyway, I was the type of person that said, well, I'll just figure this out. I'll throw pieces of wood on the lathe and I'll eventually figure this out. And so I started basically um, putting, my, putting my bowls in consignment shops. Didn't really do much for shows back in that day because I was in the military. And for those who were not aware of it, I did 24 years in the Canadian Army, five years as an infanteer with the Royal Canadian Regiment and then 19 as a vehicle tech in the EMI Corps. And so I was using wood turning at that point to supplement my income because back in those days, the military didn't pay all that great. I still believe that we are the second highest paid military in the world. Uh, and the wages have certainly come up a lot since I've retired. So that, that's certainly welcomed by, by those who serve. And uh, so anyway, I used it to supplement my income. And then my skills improved over the years, started doing inlays. I recognized very early on that it was important to, to make myself different from others that I was competing with. So that's where the inlay work all was kind of spawned from. And uh, so here we are today. Uh, resin was a bit of a struggle and it still is on occasion. <laughs> but uh, for the most part, I think that I've got the resin work or epoxy work kind of down still got some stuff to learn but you know the the big thing with resin turning over any other type of turning is that the colors are just simply amazing and what you can do to save pieces uh from the wood stove or from the bonfire pit if you will uh, take the ugliest piece of wood you've got and throw some epoxy on it and then it becomes one of the nicest things that's sitting on a table in your home. Just got a few more passes to take here. Uh, as far as complexity is concerned, this one was an easy one this week. 
other than trying to figure out what was going to be up and what was going to be down in the beginning. But I think that I absolutely made the right decision in doing that. And by all means, leave a comment down below. Let me know what you think about that. But uh, Hercules is performing great. Uh, again, you know, if you've done any amount of resin work, uh, working with burl, trying to cut that grain cleanly is an issue. And the cupped cutter that, that's on the Hercules from Hunter Tool Systems does a really good job of doing that. So less tear out equals less sanding because as we all know, nobody likes sanding. Speaking of that, these are the three and a half inch dipple discs from sandpaper.ca. Another popular size that they sell is the two and a half. I should probably get some of those as well, but the two and a half and three and a half are the most popular. I, for the most part, have stuck with just the three and a half inch since I'm a bowl turner predominantly. But if you're doing smaller work, you might want to think about getting the two and a half inch. Everything here was sanded from 60 to 800, I should mention that. And then once that's done, we're going to use some Triple E buffing compound from the Be All buffing system to take out any fine little scratches that are left in the resin. And then once that's done, we'll clean this up with some denatured alcohol and then put on our first coat of finish. Well, all right, here comes the best part. This is the first coat of Waterlux Gloss. Well, the camera died, so I don't know how much of that we actually got. Uh, that hyper shift is awesome. And the great thing is, you know, we've got we've got the separation of the two colors, but they've also combined a little bit to make more of a pink color. Burl eyes are fantastic. Beautiful piece. That right there is very cool. All right, we'll see you tomorrow for the second coat. Same thing as the first coat. Before the next coat of finish goes on, I buff with the Triple E buffing compound, then clean things up with a denatured alcohol, and then put on the next coat. If there's a third or a fourth coat, all the coats are basically done the same, or this is how they are prepped before the next coat of finish goes on. Good morning. This is the second coat of Waterlux Gloss. All right. Man, do I love that. That hyper shift has really added a ton of character to that resin. Just love it. Burl's a little harder to see in this one. Up in the corners. Outstanding. Let me know in the comments what you think. I think she's a beaut. All right, we'll see you when we're doing the bottom. Here you see the piece being mounted on my vacuum chuck. This is the eight inch chuck and it takes a lot of force to pull this off of the chuck. So the larger the chuck, the more the holding power of it this also you have to be careful because 
what it can do is if you're, the bottom of your bowl is getting thin, it can actually pull the bottom of the bowl in. So be careful of that if you're using one of these chucks. Uh, anyway, the bottom was finished from 120 to 320. It's predominantly just wood, so I didn't see the point of going any higher than that. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, I really do appreciate you watching my content. And of course, um, let's have a little chat about this week's project. I think it's truly a beautiful bowl. Love to hear what you think as well. Well, all right, let's have a last look at this beautiful bowl. I got to tilt it just the right way or else we won't see anything. Uh, three coats of Waterlux gloss on there. Uh, absolutely beautiful finish if you haven't tried it i would highly recommend it great color separation uh, hyper shift is absolutely fantastic we'll be seeing a lot more of that in the future maybe we'll see it in every project <laughs> uh, i'm really really digging it inside of this piece the burl quite nice and here's the back side the bottom if you will and as, as for normal I'm running out of time so that's why there's no finish on it uh, lots of really nice burl figure on the bottom side of this piece as well uh, I'll put some footage up at the end like I usually do and it, this should look pretty nice when it's lit from inside too uh, size on this is 10 inches that's 25 centimeters and so that's the diameter across three inches tall at 7.62 centimeters and five eighths of an inch thick you know i like my beefy bowls at 16 millimeters and it's absolutely beautiful love this profile definitely want to try to do more of these in the future and i think that it's really the only profile that would work for us as far as saving the burl and saving the resin and i should mention that this piece is for sale so if you're interested, send me an email, spragwoodturning at gmail.com, and I will disclose the price at that time, and uh, just in case it's a gift. All right, I'm going to set this down. Thanks again to sandpaper.ca for kicking in 100 bucks when we get to 100,000. Uh, so what I ask you to do in the comments is put sandpaper.ca all by itself, and if you want to be uh, a chance at winning the three gallon kit at 100,000 from Designer Epoxy, put Designer Epoxy in the comments down below. Two words. Um, and of course, that's only for continental US and Canada. Uh, my other sponsors, Hunter Tool Systems and Starbond Adhesives, they're also in the description below, and please check them out. I also get a lot of emails and questions about the things that I use in the video, but in the description down below there's Amazon links and there are other links to other vendors that will pretty much tell you everything that I use here in the workshop is listed down below. I can't list everything there because I only got uh, so much room, but uh, if you need, if you have questions about that, try looking down there first and you might find your answer. Next week we're going to be doing the nasty. And if you've been here long enough, you probably know what I mean by the nasty. I'm not going to spoil it for those who don't know what the nasty is, but it's something that I really don't like doing. But I got to do it. So we're going to do the nasty next week. So I'll just leave it at that. Please come back and find out what the nasty is. Because I don't like it. All right, well, that's it. Take care. Stay safe. Don't forget the bell. The bell notification will let you know when I upload the video. And of course, by subscribing, you'll help me get to 100,000 subscribers. And that would be awesome. See you next week.